squat. I got a, a native doing the funky chicken here. He's blocking my blade. Well, keep going, he'll move. These people have to learn that we don't stop. So what's up, High Tech Future? When Jake is separated from the team, they have to scour the woods to try and find him. Tracking isn't that hard, even without a global network of satellites. That's a clip from a YouTube video I found titled, Dumb Things in Avatar That Everyone Just Ignored. Referencing, of course, the movie Avatar, one of the top grossing films of all time, and it's a sci-fi film, has a lot of science stuff, which gets complicated at some points and you have to follow along, but then at some points it just gets really dumb. Kind of like science in general, as is so beautifully demonstrated by today's guest, the esteemed parapsychologist, scientist, philosopher, Dr. Stephen Browdy. For people who are skeptical about psi phenomena, it's almost as if a veil of stupidity descends over them and then they start going into kind of conceptual panic. And they panic more, I think, initially over PK than ESP, although ESP on the surface seems to threaten the idea of mental privacy. It's very easy to explain why people freak out over PK. If I can move, let's say, a matchstick, a millimeter by thought alone, it's a very small step conceptually from doing that to making somebody drop dead. I tell the story in Dangerous Pursuits about what happened when I tried to give a talk on my PK investigations to my physics department at the University of Maryland. I was invited to do it, and I thought they wanted me to talk about it. I was two minutes into the talk, and the faculty shouted me down. I never got to give the talk. Welcome to Skeptico, where we explore controversial science and spirituality with leading researchers, thinkers, and their critics. I'm your host, Alex Sikaris, and today we welcome back Dr. Stephen Brody to Skeptico. You know, I've had the pleasure and really honor, I mean that sincerely, of interviewing Steve several times. And as I was just chatting with him about a little bit, I went back and had to look at the records because I know it's been a long time. The, the first one was 10 years ago, which, you know, if you're interested in parapsychology, if you're seriously interested in what's called psi, but really consciousness, if you're really interested in science, which is all I was interested to begin with this, you are going to run across Stephen Brody. And uh, he has a new book out, Dangerous Pursuits, Mediumship, Mind, and Music, which you can pick up for just 10 bucks on Kindle, which is the way I got it. Amazing uh, compilation kind of capstone of a lot of the work that he's done. And uh, it's just super great to have this guy back. Super smart person. Just beyond this kind of narrowly defined little field we're going to talk about of parapsychology. Just somebody who's, it's two things I think are really great. One, you'll recognize immediately that he's very, very, very smart about a lot of different things. But two, he has this warrior spirit. I mean, this is a guy that has kind of battled against the tide relentlessly for, I don't know, I'm not going to say how many years. But uh, Steve, welcome back. Thanks so much for joining me. Thanks for having me. It's good to see you again. So tell folks, uh, you know, who is, who is Dr. Stephen Browdy? Wow. Well, I started out as, professionally at least, as kind of a, <clears throat> a mainstream philosopher. I had had an experience back in graduate school of seeing my table tilt in an impromptu seance with a couple of friends, but I was smart enough at the time not to talk to my mentors about that. I was busy. In those days, I thought of myself as a kind of hard-nosed materialist, not for any particularly good reason. It was just a kind of intellectual conceit I was cultivating at the time. And I knew nothing about parapsychology, so I literally put it out of mind until I finished my dissertation on temporal logic, uh, got a job, published what I still think are some respectable papers in the field of temporal logic and the philosophy of time, got tenure. And then I remembered what happened to me back in graduate school, seeing this table rise in the air. And I figured if I was 
an honest philosopher and intellectual and needed to come to grips with that. And I knew it at, by that time that some very well known and great philosophers had taken parapsychological research seriously. So I read what they had to say and I decided there was really something worth sinking my teeth into. And so I cranked out a, a book initially on the experimental evidence, thinking like a lot of people that if there is good evidence for psi phenomena, it would come from the laboratory. And then I figured if I was an honest intellectual, I needed to know the rest of the evidence, at least so I could have a comprehensive context in which to place all this. And I was bowled over by the evidence from physical mediumship. And what I realized at the time was that many of the parapsychologists, not, not just the skeptics, but parapsychologists themselves didn't know this evidence. They were skeptical about it. Steve, real quick, physical uh, mediumship. Tell people what that means. Sure. Well, people are familiar with the term mediumship, no doubt, but there are two kinds of mediumship. One is mental mediumship, which is what we see most often depicted in film and TV. That's where people ostensibly challenge, uh, channel uh, messages from the deceased. Physical mediumship is where uh, mediums ostensibly facilitate or mediate the production of physical phenomena like materializations, table levitations, wraps in the table, and so forth. So it's where they seem to channel PK phenomena. So let, let me just interject here because uh, I, I like your, your, your grumpiness and your gnarliness about uh, some of this stuff. I really appreciate it deeply, and I mean that sincerely. You make kind of an interesting point slash distinction here that, that is kind of curious. You point out that even people who are uh, completely uh, skeptical and very anti uh, psi parapsychology mediumship, they get extra uh, offended by the idea of physical mediumship. And I think you challenge that in kind of an interesting way. It's kind of a little subplot here, but you're like, what, what are you doing? I mean, you, you're, you're, you're not accepting one, but you're somehow showing an increased uh, ability to reject the other. In what logic space are you occupying there that that even makes any sense, right? Well, I mean, it, for people who are skeptical about psi phenomena, it's almost as if a veil of stupidity descends over them and then they start going into kind of conceptual panic. And they panic more, I think, initially over PK than ESP, although ESP on the surface seems to threaten the idea of mental privacy. Um, PK is particularly terrifying, and the reactions to my talking about PK are, have been the most extreme I've seen. And I, it's very easy to explain why people freak out over PK. If I can move, let's say, a matchstick, a millimeter by thought alone, it's a very small step conceptually from doing that to making somebody drop dead by thought alone. So the existence of any kind of PK forces us to take seriously a kind of magical worldview that most of us associate, and usually condescendingly at that, only with so-called primitive cultures. It's a worldview according to which our thoughts, unintentional or intentional, can have malevolent or lethal consequences and in which we might have to take responsibility for a whole range of things we'd just as soon be bystanders for. And modern science has been trying its damnedest to make causation as impersonal as possible. And this is just the exact opposite of that. So this is a worldview and, and people in industrialized or developed countries aren't happy about this at all. I mean, they're uncomfortable with the idea that if you have a malevolent thought about somebody, even just a passing vagrant thought, and that person has an accident, that our vagrant thought might have had something to do with it. You know, there's a, I've made this point quite often, and I apologize if I made it to you. There's an old Yiddish distinction between a shlemiel and a shlemazel. A shlemiel is someone who has soup spilt on him, and a shlemazel, uh, sorry, a shlemiel is someone who spilled soup on himself, and a shlemazel has it spilt on him. So the idea is that a shlemazel is an unlucky soul, a person that the universe is crapping on, a victim of impersonal forces or the universe at large. And shlemazels really exist. And the question is why? I mean, I was married to a shlemazel at one point. 
I prefer not to discuss that case, but <laughs> I lived next door to a couple of schlamozels. It seemed like they were living in consumer hell. Everything they bought was defective. Their cars were in the shop all the time, even though they had brands noted for their reliability. Electronic equipment would fail to work right out of the box. Their infant son was placed in a brand new rocking, solid wooden rocking chair, which collapsed under the infant son. And my favorite example of their schlamozzleness, if that's even a word. The wife bought what she thought was a poster-sized photograph of the Golden Gate Bridge. She had it framed and placed on her living room wall. And I had to tell her, Donna, that's the Brooklyn Bridge. So here's a woman who both literally and figuratively bought the Brooklyn Bridge. Now, most of us are uncomfortable with the idea that these people, this couple, I wish I knew if they were schlamozzles before they met and got married. But is this a kind of expression of their own self-loathing, their own self-hatred, or is it something that the weird philosopher next door to them was inflicting upon them? We don't know that, and there are parts of the world where that kind of thinking is taken for granted, but not in developed countries. Yeah, you know, I mean, one of the problems we're going to have with this whole little chat is every idea could spawn an hour's worth of discussion. I mean, we could we could take that and take the anthropological kind of look at it right. because we have serious, um, deep thinking, intellectual people in the West who've done their best to study that and have come and back have come back and said, "Wow, that's real." By all accounts, yes. by every way we can measure it, uh, that is not just a superstitious belief. It happens right. over and over again. But again, you know, I love that. Uh, what I wrote down the phrase, we're working so hard to make causation impersonal, which is really uh, the, the idea of materialism. So I'll tell you what, I'm going to kind of bounce around here. I want to talk about materialism, particularly about parapsychology, because that is a, a field that you've been in for a long time. And it's a field that's just in shambles. It's been decimated. It is no more. It is not relevant anymore. And anyone who says otherwise is just kind of playing pretend. But before we get there, tell us about the book, this latest book, Dangerous Pursuits, Mediumship, Mind, and Music, which I pulled up here on, uh, on Amazon. But tell us about that. Well, thank you for that opportunity. My book before this was Crimes of Reason. And when I wrote that, it was a collection of essays that I had written over the years, some old, some, and also some new essays that I thought I could do a better job on. And when I wrote that book, I figured I was all booked out and I was done. And then I thought, well, there are some other essays that I think if I had a chance for a do-over, um, I could do a better job. I could state the issues more clearly or more compellingly. So a lot of these are expanded or re otherwise revised uh, essays that I've written before on a bunch of related themes. One would be the fear of psi. Uh, the other would be the problems of studying mixed mediums like Kai Muga or Carlos Mirabelli. And then some problems in explaining why it's difficult to know what the evidence for survival of bodily death is all about. And then there's a little dessert chapter on jazz improvisation. Yeah, there's a lot to mine out of the book. And uh, it, again, you've had such an extensive career. And I, I guess I want to circle back a little bit because the introduction you were doing is excellent. But as most people who have accomplished a lot do, they kind of leave out a lot of important steps along the way because they don't want to sound like they're <laughs> braggy or anything. But you've kind of seen it all, done it all in the parapsychology community and more broadly in the, I don't know, scientific paranormal community. I always re reference the Journal of Scientific Exploration because I think they've done a great job for a long time of trying to hold that space. You're an editor of the journal for, uh, how many years were you doing that? Since 2009, I think. And, uh, you know, I mean, that's just that what that means to people who are uninitiated is that Steve is not just comfortable and super qualified and competent to talk about all this stuff, but like the stuff that crosses his desk is everything imaginable that can be not imagined to be scientific until you look at the data. So uh, ET, abduction, Bigfoot, 
Uh, what else am I leaving out? I mean, everything, the, the astrology, you know, I interviewed a, a woman who published in the JSE that did an extraordinarily uh, competent job looking at whether astrology shows an effect. Uh, so what else uh, runs across your desk there that people should know about? Oh, gee, I don't even know how to answer that. Yeah. I'm sorry, I literally don't know how to answer that. <laughs> well, it, it, in general, because I think it does relate to this, uh, go back to this term I love, uh, you know, trying to get away from causation as much as can, trying to make it as impersonal as we can. And so- Oh, I know how I can answer it. Okay. One of my big targets has been mechanistic explanations in science. Um, and taking psi phenomena and psychological phenomena as primitive in a sense. You know, there's, most scientists would agree that explanation by analysis, explanation of a phenomenon in terms of lower level processes is something that can't continue indefinitely. That sooner or later you're going to hit rock bottom, you're going to hit some phenomena that are fundamental, that are basic or primitive, and it, which at that point, you can no longer profitably ask how they occur. That's just the way the universe works, and no deeper explanation will explain why. Now, that's fine. But what most scientists also assume is that wherever those primitive phenomena occur, they're always at the level of the very small, you know, the microscopic, the subatomic, the atomic, the uh, biochemical, something like that, never at the observable level. But that's just an article of faith. That is not an empirically established fact. And it's a big topic in philosophy where explanation by analysis comes to an end. I happen to believe and have argued at length for saying that um, in the realm of psychology and by extension in the realm of parapsychology where intention plays an in, ineliminable in role, patterns appear first at the level of behavior, at the level of the phenomena. That doesn't mean explanation comes to an end. It just means that vertical explanation, explanation by analysis, comes to an end. There are still covering law explanations, explanation by analogy. There are many forms of explanation, in fact. Explanation by analysis, like explaining heat in terms of molecular motion, that kind of explanation can, cannot help us in the realm of the mental. I always wonder, you know, that's such a great deconstruction or analysis of the problem, but I almost feel all, all, sometimes like you're analyzing it from within the paradigm that you're forced to operate in, you know, because like you're a philosopher, I mean, if you take the, uh, take an idealism kind of viewpoint and say consciousness is somehow fundamental and, and that's where the evidence really leads from the beginning from the devil's led experiment on and really before that, you know, consciousness is fundamental. Everything is in consciousness and is a manifestation of consciousness. Not saying that's true, but I'm just saying from that perspective, I'm not even sure we'd talk about things in that way. Well, there's a reason I, I do it the way I do. I mean, I'm in a kind of privileged position because I had a good reputation in philosophy before I got into parapsychology and polluted myself. Um, and you know, there were people at the time who were saying things to me, like a famous logician once said to me, if somebody has to do this, I'm glad it's you. Uh -huh. I think she meant that as a compliment, but it could be taken various ways. Yes. Um, so, because I have the status that I had in the academic community before I was corrupted, um, people are at least willing to listen to me. And because I think I argue very convincingly for some things, uh, I hope to sh shake certain mainstream academics out of their mainstream academic complacency. Once I can plant seeds of doubt in their mind about the way they've been doing things, that softens them up for getting out of that way of thinking. And so that's the path that I think I've been particularly um, well qualified to follow. Yes, and, and, I, and I love your story. You know, are you, uh, are there, <laughs> like they say about the pioneers. Yeah, you can always tell the pioneers because they don't just have arrows in their front side. They have arrows <laughs> in their backside as well, you know. <laughs> so 
you know, a few years ago, I had an opportunity to actually just had an email exchange with uh, the well-known atheist, Sam Harris, who isn't known as being a particularly deep thinker or, or, or constructing very good, solid, logical arguments, at least in my opinion, it all kind of falls away pretty quickly. But I was always struck by his very matter-of-fact, in-your-face assessment of parapsychology and psi. And he said it's in the backwater of science. And that was a few years ago. And as much as I, you know, don't think much of him intellectually, he's spot on. It's, it's, it's always been the backwater of science. And in the years since we've spoken, it's just worse. Objectively, if you measure how many of the search results you get, it's prominence, it's uh, a published peer-reviewed papers, the, the PhDs, the, there are none, you know? And it's so- tr It's true, I mean, there's- it's, But one of the- here's, the past here's 150 the years, it's been true. Well, it, it, but it's especially true lately as, because here's the point I guess that I was gonna make is that, that the, really the best evidence has continued to pile up. You know, it's yes. not like there's a few pioneer researchers out there like you and others who complete, continue to put out more and better solid science that just gets, you know, further pushed, repressed, suppressed. And I wonder if there isn't more to that. I definitely think there's more to it. I think Well, there that, are a couple of things. One is that most of the people doing sci research don't have tenure. So they don't have the delicious protection that uh, tenure can afford. And the other thing is, a lot of the people who are doing studies in parapsychology now are still just following conventional um, laboratory protocols. They haven't learned some important lessons. And I've been arguing for decades now that laboratory research in parapsychology is almost absurdly premature because we don't know what the natural history of psi is. We don't know exactly what it's doing out in the world. And until we have a firm grip on that, we have no idea what it is we're taking into the lab. It might be as inappropriate to study it in the lab as it will be to study courage or sensuality under laboratory conditions. You're only gonna get straitjacketed manifestations of, at best, you're only gonna get that in the laboratory. You know, th that's a really interesting point, uh, but I'm not even going to go there for a minute. I'm going to take it in a couple of different directions because this is where my journey is going. So first question is invisible college. Does there exist uh, quote unquote invisible college when it comes to parapsychology, extended consciousness, and this, all these phenomena in general? I think there is. What do you I'm think? I'm not sure what you mean by invisible college. Well, you know, I recently interviewed uh, Dr. Diana Walsh Pasolka, who wrote a book called American Cosmic. And her work, she's in religious studies. She's doing these work on like saints and uh, in the Catholic tradition and some of the accounts and stuff like that. And one of her colleagues reads one of those and goes, that's a UFO story. And she's like, what do you mean? No, it's, it's an account of someone back... 300 years ago who had this. So next thing you know, she's in Maryland at a UFO conference. And she meets a gentleman named Chris Bledsoe, who is pretty amazing in terms of the uh, contact experiences he's had. And he's uh, been kind of well documented. He's had these experiences, not just himself, but with others, both in his family and others not related to him, manifesting different phenomenon, you know, all this kind of stuff. So she gets really interested now, and she goes to a conference in Silicon Valley and meets Jacques Vallée, and uh, he kind of tours her around Silicon Valley, which is like a dream come true to, for her. She goes to the desert in, in uh, Nevada and finds this guy who actually reverse engineers space junk that he finds through this means of kind of this metal detector that he's rigged up. And again, this is, uh, you know, Dr. Diana walsh Pasolka. she's got all the credentials and she hasn't given up any of those credentials. She's a sharp person. She's not a wing nut here. But as part of her book, what she reveals is this hidden college, invisible college. And Jacques Vallée, I think, is responsible for, if not coining the term, kind of popularizing it. 
And she says, as a matter of fact, she's at a conference when somebody stands up and says, makes some kind of question or something like that. And another person across the room says, hey, we're not supposed to talk about that. That's not, you know, allowed. And one of her colleagues who she directly knows is brought into the invisible college. He receives a note and he says, okay, kind of a fight club thing. First rule of fight, fight club is we don't talk about fight club, but he becomes an insider. And this has to do with, uh, you know, basically ET kind of stuff. But I think the same is true in, in parapsychology in the sense the point I always point out is, you know, the MK Ultra project, which a lot of people don't realize it's MK Ultra, but Stargate, the remote viewing project. You know, if you go read, if you go, an interview, I read, um, interviewed Joe McMonagle, secret spy number 000, remote viewer looking at Russian submarines. When he shows up and he meets Russell Targ and Hal Putoff, they are not, they're not trying to hammer out whether materialism exists, whether there is an extended, I mean, they are so, this is the 70s, they are so far past that. I mean, they're light years in front of that. I'm not sure what you want me to respond to that. I mean, well, I, yes, I, I guess the original question is invisible college. Do you believe there is such a thing? Well, there are certainly there's a network of people who um, already have a fairly well-defined set of assumptions and intellectual projects and questions that they're addressing. And sure, there's, there's a subset of people more or less officially in parapsychology or who have been over the past three or four or five or six decades. Um, and there are projects they work on between them, if that's what you have in mind. And of course, they're, they're not bound by the uh, constraints of uh, university life. And university life has become increasingly uh, rigid and uh, unsavory, in fact, I would say. Okay. And do, you might not agree with this at all, which is kind of fine. But... Um, I think we're talking about something different here. We're talking about Hal Putoff and Russell Targ and their, you know, anyone I always remind people, you can go watch videos of them testing, quote unquote, Uri Geller, right? And they're testing at Stanford yes. Research Institute and he's exhibiting incredible ESP powers or whatever you want to call it, psi abilities. So the point being, that this is all denied, right? These guys are doing this in the 70s. And Ted Koppel's doing nightline news reports. But in general, the response was that isn't happening. That isn't real. That couldn't possibly be true. And I don't think that's accidental. I think that's, again, I think the parallels to the UFO community. I think there's disinformation, there's co-opting, there's you know criticizing, and there's controlling the thing. but. There's obviously people in our government who are interested in that, who are pursuing it in a way that is in direct contradiction to what is being reported by academia, whether they know it or not. Yes, and I don't know why it's being suppressed at the federal level, if, assuming that it is. I think the reasons may be a bit different for, for the ET situation, because I think a lot of people would argue that um, if word gets out about having been visited or in contact with uh, extraterrestrials that the public just wouldn't be able to handle it. I don't think that information about psi phenomena is being withheld because the public couldn't handle it because it's been out there in the public for a long time. And maybe we ought to just move off that, but I, you know, I won't move off of that completely because I'll show you another interview that I did that I thought was really, really interesting to me. And that's a guy I really, pissed off, but uh, Ed May, <laughs> who sure. was uh, the head of the Stargate program for 10 years, and very, very anti, uh, in my interview with him, anti-parapsychology, anti, anti uh, it being anything other than materialistic science. Yes. And one of the most curious things about that interview for me is he wanted to correct me about the experience of Joe McMonagle. And I had to say, Ed, 
what are you talking about? I have the transcript of the interview the guy gave me. It was connected to his near-death experience. That's what he was told. His secret personnel file, they pulled the Raymond Moody book out of there. And he was just like, doesn't, couldn't have anything to do with uh, near-death experience or anything, quote unquote, spiritual. This is all just solid materialistic science and we'll get to the bottom of it. Again, the optics to me, I don't know, but he just seems like a, a, a cut out figure. He doesn't seem like he's a genuine, curious intellect. He seems like a guy who's doing a job and his job is to kind of bury this stuff. Otherwise, there's, it, it's, it stands in direct contradiction to everything that we now know of uh, what was going on inside that program. I'm afraid I have to agree with you about it. I mean, I've known him for decades. And he's been a big disappointment to me. I've tried, he denies the existence of any PK despite the overwhelming evidence. And I've asked him at least to respond to my arguments and tell me what's wrong with them. And he's steadfastly refused to do that. He steadfastly refused to look at the evidence that I've presented, the arguments that I've presented. He just flatly denies it and trots out the usual skeptical thing. It's all hocus pocus or it's mal-observation and so on. So here's my question, Steve, and I poked, it, poked you with it enough, so then I'll leave it alone, is <laughs> what if he's just doing his job? What if, that's, what if that is really his job? Whether he's, uh, in, whether he's instructed to do that kind of directly in a smoky dark room in the back, or whether it's the useful idiot thing where you just find somebody who's messaging what you want and you continue to feed the beast. I mean, there's no other way. I, I think it's the former because there's no other way to explain how this guy winds up running the Stargate program. I mean, how, how would that, that'd be the most illogical kind of ineffective way to kind of run that program unless you didn't really want to get results. Yeah, I can't speculate about that. I mean, it may just be the fear of Psy and I've seen it demonstrated very dramatically with physicists. I tell the story in Dangerous Pursuits about what happened when I tried to give a talk on my PK investigations to my physics department at the University of Maryland. I was invited to do it, and I thought they wanted me to talk about it. I was two minutes into the talk, and the faculty shouted me down. I never got to give the talk. And they were trotting out the usual old shit. Yeah. What do you mean they shouted you down? Well, they started shaking and standing up and saying, well, Randy has shown that it's all nonsense. Uh, or they would just say, there's no evidence. There's no evidence. And I said, well, I can present the evidence. And they didn't want to hear it. I think this is so relevant to where we're at now in uh, culturally. I feel like we're, we're rapidly moving to kind of a post-scientific world, if we haven't already been there, where, you know, science, as we understand it, as you understand it, as you said, you know, you described yourself as a you know, curious intellectual who felt a, an obligation as a professional, an ethical obligation to pursue things. That just seems to be out the window, where it's now science is by edict, science is by uh, fake science of if I can fool you, if I can convince you. Any thoughts on that? I know it's a broad question. Well, science today is so connected with money that it's hard to separate the good science from the science that's uh, predestined by the people who are funding it. And I mean, there's still a lot of pure science going on. I wouldn't want to reject the entire body of modern science because it's been abused. Anything can be used that can be used for the good can be used for the bad as well. Fair enough. You know, you were nice enough, Steve, to kind of play along with the little survey that I sent you. <laughs> now, you you kind of balked at some of them in, for ways that I totally respect. You're not very tolerant of the kind of pigeonholing, cut it down to a, a Twitter tweet to sum up deep philosophical and scientific questions. I'm but, not a soundbite guy. You're not a soundbite guy. Okay, good. I love it. That's, that was a good soundbite, by the way, right? <laughs> <laughs> but, 
But, you know, one that you did answer that I think is the fundamental question in a way, and that's, is there a moral imperative? First, we I always got to remind people of this, you know, we live in a scientific world that insists that consciousness is an illusion, that you are a biological robot in a meaningless universe. And sure, we have some nice, well, uh, well-groomed dissenters like the one you're seeing in this interview, but they do have to report to their bosses who will tell them ultimately, like they did when they shouted you down, that never mind, consciousness is an illusion and there can't possibly be meaning. So in my little survey, you answered yes to there is a moral imperative. Yes, there is good and evil. Do you want to explain that? Are you sure you mean that? Do you really think there is a moral imperative? There's good and evil? I won't pretend to have worked this out in the detail that I've worked out some of my positions in philosophy, but if I had to be pushed right now, I'd say I'm a kind of moral intuitionist. And that if you get people to agree on what the facts are, more often than not, you'll get them to agree on what's right and what's wrong. Let's suppose there's a culture in which people think that burying the elderly alive leads them to a healthier and more profitable afterlife. And so they think it's okay to bury people while they're alive. Those of us who think that it's not okay to bury people uh, while they're alive because there's no connection to an afterlife uh, would disagree with that. But if you could get them to agree on the relationship of whether there is an afterlife, first of all, and secondly, whether there's any connection between the quality of one's afterlife and the condition in which they're buried, probably they would agree to whether or not it's the best thing to do to bury someone while alive. So you get people to agree on the facts and you'll get them to agree more often than not on what's right and what's wrong. That's a more extreme example, but I think it makes a point. Well, the other way I'd approach it, and I'd like to hear your uh, idea on that is, as we collect more and more evidence about consciousness, about uh, mediumship, and again, your evidence doesn't come down you don't read the evidence on mediumship the same way that I do, which is fine. You mean mental mediumship? Mental mediumship. But overwhelmingly, the evidence suggests that there is a hierarchy to consciousness, I think, or a perceived hierarchy, which is all we can really go on as perception, is that there are perceived hierarchy. Particularly if you take the near-death experience science that is compiled the best that they can. I mean, it has limitations in what they can do, but, you know, we trust asking people whether or not they feel depressed, and then after a certain therapy, whether they still feel depre uh, depressed. So I think we're kind of within the realm of science to ask people what they experienced before and what they experience now, what are their beliefs, what are their feelings about God, you know, hierarchy of consciousness. And the, the, the data that we get back is overwhelmingly that people that have this particular kind of experience during a time when consciousness is not supposed to be available in their brain state, they have an understanding of a relationship with a, a hierarchical consciousness. As evidence for survival of bodily death, I don't consider the near-death experience to be particularly helpful. I think there are much more persuasive kinds of cases, which, and even those, I'd say, it's hard to know how to interpret, and particularly whether we need to explain them in terms of psychic functioning among the living or some kind of post-mortem existence. And even then, the most we get from the evidence for survival is not the conclusion that everybody survives. The most we could ever conclude would be that some people survive and even then only for a limited time. We don't have evidence that everybody survives, much less that they survive forever. We could spend a lot of time going down that road. I'm interested in your comments and what I said in terms of uh, what that data set suggests regarding this moral imperative. It seems to also be in line with what we find with uh, entheogens, what we find with uh, out-of-body experience. 
I mean, these people are coming back and saying, yeah, there is good, there is right or wrong, and the intuitive sense you have of what it is, is, is reliable. It's a transformative experience, and without doubt. For most people, some, for some people, it's still a bad experience. You know, there are people who in NDEs confront the devil. Um, but religious experiences generally uh, are transformative in a similar kind of way. And lead people to various ideas about the basic ethical imperatives from different perspectives. You know, the great religions tend to converge on certain general ideas about what's right and what's wrong. There are exceptions, granted. Yeah, but uh, I, don't, I don't really care what the religions converge on. I'm not religious and I'm not Christian and I, I, I don't care. What I care is uh, some sort of independent data set on that. And uh, again, I'm not really interested in the, the ethical part, you know, because, hey, you talk to any, any of these half-wit, you know, uh, Sam Harris atheist types, and they'll give you, you know, it's a social construct, right? I'm reluctant to comment on that because I don't feel I have a sufficiently well-worked out position. So I don't give half-assed answers to uh, uh, deep questions. I'm not going to do that. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, you don't be sorry, but it is, it, it's the, it's the space we're in. Everyone has a position on that. Isn't everyone's position half-assed? Well, probably so, but I don't like to go on record with my half-assed positions. It's too easy to, uh, uh, so what, what positions do you have that aren't half-assed? What do you know for the sure? The ones I write about. Doesn't the moral imperative question make everything look half-assed? Well, I've given you, <laughs> I've given you a kind of answer to that. I mean, I you told did. you I believe you I'm, a, I'm an ethical uh, intuitionist. I think that uh, uh, most people have the same kinds of intuitions about what's right and what's wrong. What they are likely to disagree about is what the facts are. You get them to agree about the facts, you'll find that their intuitions tend to converge. Yeah. So well, I'll leave it go. I'm just always curious when people you know, are really excited about one data set and feel completely, you know, annoyed or not annoyed with a, a, another data set. But you live in a different, in a different world in terms of, like I said, you're the frontline soldier. So I respect what you've had to go through and you got to I'm not draw. annoyed by the other data set. I just, I, I like to be cautious about putting myself forward on certain views. I don't think your work reflects that. I don't well, think you're cautious. I'm... I don't think you're cautious in that in that way. I think you're you're kind of the opposite of cautious. And even your point about I'm aggressive. Yes, you're extremely aggressive. And you you make some great points, like your point about the laboratory work, which we can just kind of uh, we we kind of breeze past. But I think it's an incredibly significant insight you have there is that uh, the, the science types, even in these uh, fringe areas, if you will, frontier areas, if you will, they still have this, um, it, it, as you said, uh, unexplainable uh, leaning on the lab when that doesn't really make a lot of sense if we haven't first identified what we think are the, what we would bring into the lab, what we're, what we're even controlling. The skeptic CEM Hansel was interviewed for that NOVA program decades ago. And he said, it's easy to tell if telepathy is real, just tell me what I'm thinking. And I'm very sorry that his interlocutor didn't say to him, oh, is that right, Professor Hansel? Well, let's see an erection. <laughs> I'm sure right. Hansel would not have agreed that he's simply incapable of getting it up. Love it. Let me uh, kind of switch gears a little bit. Another topic I'm super interested in. We're going to be, I hope people can read through this, that I so respect, again, I'll say the, the work that you've done, the tremendous contribution you've made to science I think it's almost like a, a disservice to say the field of parapsychology. Jeez, if, if anything, this discussion should let people uh, understand that the, the intellectual community as a whole and science in particular is in, in, indebted to 
the, the brave work that you've done of being shouted off the stage and con continuing to per persist, continuing to be aggressive, continuing to not be bullied, cajoled, or co-opted into saying anything that anybody wants you to say. So I, I, I respect that. Well, flattery will get you everywhere. Uh, excellent. That will work then, because I want to talk about <laughs> chapter 11, multiple personality and the structure of self. Tell us where you're at, what you think, what you've discovered. Well, I wrote a book about multiple personality initially because, well, for two reasons. One, it's just interesting as hell. And secondly, I knew I wanted to write a book on survival of death, especially when I was more chronologically challenged. And I knew also that um, the phenomenon of multiple personality looks suspiciously like the phenomenon of mental mediumship. And it's not that I thought that they were the same, but I felt it would be intellectually irresponsible to uh, write about survival without having a firm grasp of the history of hypnosis and psychopathology and uh, multiple personality in particular. And I was astounded and dismayed to discover that a lot of the people writing on survival hadn't a clue about multiple personality. So my work on that has been to try to explain in what respect alter identities are different from one another and the kinds of inferences we can draw uh, about the nature of the self. And the big point that I was arguing for in my book, First Person Plural, was that even though these distinctions between the alter identities are quite profound, there's an even deeper kind of underlying unity of consciousness. Okay, great. So we're going to talk about that. <laughs> Forewarned, like we just said, I may not come down the same way that you did. Just interviewed a guy I, I really respect a lot. Have you ever encountered uh, Dr. Bernardo Castrup? Well, I know who he is. Okay. Um, have you ever spoken with him or read no. his? Okay. So uh, Bernardo, for people who don't know, is a PhD in philosophy, but also PhD in computer science, and has been kind of one of the leading intellectuals pushing idealism and really as a kind of direct contradiction to wacky materialism. He's kind of willing to be pretty out there in your face. So he just wrote a, an article published in Scientific American about uh, dissociative identity, and he referenced a couple of interesting experimental uh, results that have come about. One was from a woman from, um, I want to get this right. She was from Holland, I believe, and she experienced, uh, the blind, she was blind in one of her altered dissociative identity states. Under fMRI, she revealed, the, the fMRI looked to neurologists as a blind person. So again, w we wouldn't have a way of kind of explaining that. How does that how do those, and you were aware of other experiences, people who can make uh, physiological changes to their body that aren't sure. easily readily explainable inside of a materialistic kind of paradigm. How does that fit into your model? Oh, I think it fits very comfortably. I mean, when I talk about the unity of consciousness, I'm talking about uh, a kind of Kantian synthesizing of experience. Um, the kinds of things that I gather Castrop was talking about, there have been experiments like that for some time. Right. Um, and, and I think and, he's basically in, in your camp. But let me take it a, a, a couple steps further, because here's where it gets interesting to me. You know, uh, do you know uh, Whitley Strieber? I know of him. Know of him. So I just interviewed Whitley recently, and for people who don't know, um, Whitley Strieber is probably one of the best known uh, uh, alien contact ease kind of in history. And uh, she, he's done it, his best-selling book, Communion, was absolutely culture-changing in terms of what it did in bringing awareness to that. And again, I, I want to put it in the context just so people always have to do this. We live now in a post-disclosure world, right? So the New York Times has published the videos. CBS News, Fox News, Washington Post, everyone has now said, yes, those are videos released by the Department of Defense. Those are craft flying at G-forces that human beings can't handle. 
flying at speeds that we have no even imagination of how we would achieve. And I don't know if you are aware of this, but are exhibiting um, uh, this, uh, this, again, these psi phenomena in, in terms of uh, meeting at a predetermined location that no one knows and their, you know, ET is showing up there in these, in the craft. And uh, again, you know, I, I have to remind you, this is not like uh, alien hour at midnight. This is the reports of the Department of Defense as published in the Journal of Record, the New York Times, as I interviewed Leslie Kane on this show, who was a co-author of those papers. So as a lot of people have suspected a long time, you know, maybe part of our interest in this extended consciousness has been that we have known for a long time that these non-human intelligences are operating in that realm. But we'll leave that to speculation. Back to Whitley. Whitley at, I think it was like nine years old, is recruited into a special gifted children's program. By the way, his, uh, his dad is military intelligence. His uncle is military intelligence. He didn't really put all the pieces together. But he goes to this program and it's an MK Ultra, it's another MK Ultra program because we now know MK Ultra, you know, the US mind control program, which we now know had like 150 different sub programs one of which was Stargate, one of which was MK Often, where they brought in witches or you know, other people who do that. Oh, I can do occult stuff. Whatever we can do to reach that extended consciousness realm. But what Whitney's claim is, and I can give you two or three other interviews that do say the exact same thing. And we have the, the is that ritual abuse, there's a, a relationship between ritual abuse and the propensity to have a dissociative identity disorder. That's given, that's in the literature. So what Whitley says is that that's what they were trying to do. So as a kid, they were putting these, abusing these kids like they abused Whitley and trying to crack them open in a way to create dissociative identity disorder mm -hmm. in order to weaponize it, in order to exploit it in some way that we don't fully understand but we have some ideas of how and why they might want to do that. That's a lot that I kind of put on the table. Do you buy into any of that? Well, I know that Colin Ross has been writing about this for quite some time, and I respect Colin. Um, I can't say I've studied this in the kind of depth that I've studied things that I go on record about, but I, I think there's something worth sinking one's teeth into here. So I don't find it incredible at all. Fair enough. What do you feel like saying about the potential that there, in these realms, there are these other forces that we have to consider in a more authentic way? Well, there's so many realms we don't understand. We don't understand prodigies and savants. I mean, I find savants particularly interesting, how somebody who's spastic until he sits down to play the piano uh, can operate, or how calendar savants can factor any number you give them but can't add the change in their pocket. So they've got deficits, cognitive deficits, that would seem to rule out their extraordinary abilities. So I think there's a lot we don't understand about uh, the extent of our mental capacities and what could be unleashed in dissociative contexts, hypnotic contexts, uh, extreme danger, you know, how people can suddenly find themselves much stronger than they would ordinarily be. There's a lot we don't know and an appalling lack of curiosity. So angels and demons, Steve. I'm not sure about that. Um, I'm particularly interested in transplant cases, and uh, which to me looks like uh, departed spirits hovering around their vital organs. So as we go forward, take a big step back. You've been in the field of, uh, if we can still say, parapsychology is a field, and it is. I kind of came down pretty hard on it just to kind of elicit some kind of reaction. Where do you think we're headed in the next 10, 20 years? What kind of progress can we make along the lines that uh, you and some of your colleagues have been pursuing? Well, if they go along the lines I've been pursuing, we'd get the hell out of the lab and start looking for exceptional subjects and try to get a, a feel for the natural history of Psy. Um, 
but if you want to know where I think we're actually going, <laughs> I think that we'll be stuck in the same rut that we've been in for the past 120, 30 years. And one of the reasons is that new people come into the field all the time with no background in the rich literature, just as I did. You know, I had to find out after writing a book on the experimental evidence that there was much better evidence. And it's not as if there's a widely disseminated curriculum in parapsychology that people can progress through before uh, they actually start doing research in the field. They start doing research in the field and try to reinvent the wheel. It happens over and over. Every young generation of parapsychological researchers commits the same mistakes that their forebears do. Well, folks, our guest again has been the extraordinary Dr. Stephen Browdy. Check out his latest book. He's mentioned some of his other books. The latest is Dangerous Pursuits. Find it on Amazon. Again, it's just 10 bucks. But all his other books, which you can find on his website, you can easily Google him, S-T-E-P-H-E-N-B-R-A-U-D-E. And uh, excellent website, all his former books and all that. Many great articles, just a real, real, uh, I don't know. I don't like to say giant. That sounds kind of hokey, but <laughs> such a significant person in this field and in science in general. Steve, thank you so, so much for joining me. It's been an absolute pleasure. Thank you for having me. It's good to see you again. Thanks again to Dr. Stephen Browning for joining me today on Skeptico. The one question I'd have to tee up from this interview, kind of an inside baseball question. What do you think the future is for parapsychology? Have they sufficiently backwatered it into insignificance? Or is it prime for a resurgence? Let me know your thoughts. Of course, best place to do it, Skeptico Forum. Check it out. Let me hear from you. Good shows, good shows, good shows coming up. Stay with me for all of that. Until next time, take care. Bye for now.